Hi everyone, good evening. I hope you're all good. If you were with us last week, um, welcome back and thank you for joining us again this week. For those of you who are new to us, um, you are very welcome, a very warm welcome from the Rekeating team and also from Eddie and Deirdre. Um, so again, uh, we, we are here on every Wednesday until the 30th of September, so hopefully you'll be able to join us for the next two Wednesdays also. This evening marks the start of what we feel is a very important but challenging conversation as we look at preserving the self when caring for someone with cancer. And in particular for those who maybe are coming towards the end of life or actually in need of early palli palliative care. Last week we took our first step and acknowledged those of you who are carers for people in your lives with cancer. And some of the words that still resonate with me from last week um, are, it can be a blessing or a curse. And depression being explained in the most compassionate way I've heard in a long time as a profound sadness. All four series will be hosted by Eddie Murphy. Um, and Eddie with his own experience with cancer and caring and as a clinical psychologist. At this juncture, I would like to thank Eddie sincerely for sharing his story so honestly last week um, and telling us how it is and, and how it affects life, people's lives, his life, his family's life, um, and how in fact it affects people's lives in general uh, when a cancer diagnosis is brought into the home. Um, cancer itself and the diagnosis is a life-changing event and it often changes how we feel and how we think about everything. However, there are over 180,000 people in Ireland who are surviving cancer, and we do need to remember that too. There are now survivorship programs um, available around Ireland. They were face to face, face of course, but now they're in, in kind of webinar style, which is not the same, but they are available. Um, and they're becoming very much a part of how cancer patients and survivors are looked after. Um, People are, are taught to self-manage themselves in, into a new life, a different life from before, but equally learn how to manage living with the lingering side effects. And probably more importantly, um, and what most people would say, living with uncertainty. So will the cancer come back? The worry that cancer survivors fear, but also that their carers fear. And what if it does? What do we do then? What support services are available and where do we seek that help? The conversation is extremely challenging, um, but it is necessary. And I will introduce our guest speaker once I've covered the housekeeping rules. So here we are, housekeeping rules again. I'm sure those of you who have attended webinars on a regular basis are very familiar with them. Um, but nonetheless, in order to get a conversation going and to get good participation, I think this is a really important part of the webinar too. So you're in your own homes, make yourselves comfortable, make sure you have a drink. And, and if you want to get up and walk about, please do. Um, just make sure you can hear us and see us. Eddie is showing us a glass of water there, I hope. Um, you can turn off your phone or silence it. Ava, our communications executive is in the background and she's managing IT for us tonight. So thank you very much, Ava. All is going well so far. As an attendee, um, you, you, do not, you cannot turn on your video um, and we can't hear you. So the, we rely very heavily then on the Q&A button, which is on the bottom of your screen. And we would really encourage you um, to use this question and answer button and participate in the webinar, um, either anonymously or by name, whichever you would prefer. Um, we have our senior oncology nurse, Bernie, in the background, and Bernie is moderating the Q&A session for us. So thank you, Bernie. Um, you do this so well every time. Um, so look at the questions. If you want to submit a question, press the Q&A button, um, type in your question and press enter or return key. And that question will come to us as a panel and we will, we will, we will be talking and hopefully participating throughout the webinar. Um, if you see a question that you wanted to ask and you like it, there is a like icon like the icon on Facebook. Just press that and it will often um, push that question to the top of the queue. Um, and we'll be able to answer those hopefully um, throughout the webinar. 
Um, okay, so uh, we do have a recording of this, but it is a private recording and it is only it will only be available for those of you who have linked in and I think that's reasonable because again, um, you know, some of the content within the webinar is very personal um, and it is the lived experience, which is really important for the people who are um, participating. Um, it's always nice to know who's in who's in the background. I guess we're like you know if we're doing face to face seminars. We often know who is in the room, and we will often have a chat afterwards. But I would like to welcome um, our Marie Keating staff, um, nurses, and our CEO Liz, who I know is listening in tonight. I would also like to welcome um, those of you who have been a part of the Marie Keating Foundation and have gone come through our six week Survive and Thrive programs, but also our ladies and one gentleman who is a member of our positive living group. And these are a group of women and men who have um, breast cancer or another cancer that has spread to other parts of the body. Um, so this topic of conversation is really important. And I know there's a lot of enthusiasm within the group and um, positive living to talk this and to get it out there and, and to make people much more aware of the benefits. And really to the wider community, those of you who are carers and you are here tonight to learn more about the supportive services available to you and to support you through um, what can be a very challenging and as we said earlier, a blessing or a curse at times. And I'm sure, you know, everyone who's a carer will feel that from time to time. So last week we, we acknowledged the role of the carer um, and we had Catherine Cox from uh, Family Carers Ireland. Um, so you can always go to their website for further information, but you can also come to our own website on surviveandthrive.ie where that information is now available on a link to. Um, and this week we have um, Eddie obviously talking about preserving the self, but we'd, I'd also like to welcome Deirdre Shanger from the Irish Hospice Foundation. Um, Deirdre has dropped off there for a minute, but hopefully we'll see her back. And next week we're going to talk about compassion fatigue and building resilience and preventing burnout. And that will, we'll have a guest speaker, our own very nurse who is a carer herself, but also works um, within the foundation. So again, talking about different challenges um, when, though, when you know, people have to go out to work as well. And last, the last week we'll talk about the importance of self-care and we have um, Dr. Sinead Lynch, who's a psychotherapist, and she's going to do a little bit of mindfulness with us. So give us some skills to take away um, that we can use uh, week on week thereafter. Um, so again, as I said last week, mo most people's lives have changed during COVID, um, you know, but in time, the pandemic will pass. But in relation to cancer and being a carer, these questions often raise their ugly head. So recurrence, cancer is back, secondary, metastases, palliative care, pain, depression, disability, end of life, community care hospice care, holistic, complementary therapy, relaxation, comfort, dignity, planned, thinking ahead and quality. Now, what I've done here is I've mixed lots of words together, but also come out the other side, feeling the comfort um, and the dignity in actually talking about and receiving um, early palliative care. So for those of you who are in the audience, sorry, just go back there for a minute, um, who are carers, some of these thoughts become reality, particularly for those who, who have had a family member or has a family member and their cancer has relapsed or come back. These are real fears and real feelings and real emotions. Um, and these emotions are experienced here. Um, um, it, it always comes back or maybe it never goes away the isolation, the uncertainty, the fear and the anger at simply not being able to live out their lives the way they wished. So during COVID and with all of this, we're still protecting, um, we're still cocooning. Um, communication virtually has become more difficult and we all know that face-to-face -face is probably the most powerful and being in a room, um, the being with somebody is extremely important and touch. And a lot of those things aren't happening at the moment. So we need to, we need to um, acknowledge this, we need to honor it, and we need to talk about it. So you will have met Eddie last week, those of you who are with us, and Eddie is a clinical psychologist. Um, and again, as I said earlier, has um, his own story to tell. 
Um, he has a passion and enthusiasm about well-being um, and is anchored in evidence-based psychology. So Eddie, you're very welcome. I'm just going to introduce Deirdre now and then, and then I think we'll open up a little bit of a conversation around preserving the self. Um, so our topic of discussion tonight um, with Eddie and Deirdre and myself is preserving the self. Um, and again, um, I said this last week, but I, you know, I, I say it again. I think it's extremely important to, for us all to have respect um, for everybody within the group. Um, everything that's said in this group is confidential. Um, and during this hour, we may share feelings and experiences just as they are. There are no right or wrong statements to make. They are your own feelings. Um, and the sharing that takes place is a gift for everyone. Um, in this room and what you choose to share is really very much appreciated and can people can learn from it. So our guest speaker tonight is Deirdre um, and Deirdre um, is from the Irish Hospice Foundation um, currently working there as the National Development Manager in Palliative Care and End of Life. Um, Deirdre is a registered nurse who has worked with older people as a nurse and a nurse manager and she has her degree in general nursing and she has a master's in gerontology and a European certificate in palliative dementia care um, since 2014. And her work at the Irish Hospice Foundation Centre is on advanced care planning, the palliative care for all and primary palliative care programmes. So within the panel tonight, I'm happy to say that we have three very well experienced nurses to take us through. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now um, and Eddie, I'm going to bring you in there just to maybe say a few words yourself about preserving the self um, before we bring Deirdre in to talk about resources and supportive services. Um, and we know it's very challenging. So um, I'll leave it over to you there, Eddie. Thanks very much. Uh, so again, it's, uh, I want to thank the Mary Keating Foundation for asking me to host over the next the, you know, four sessions on, on, on carers. And for those uh, that came last week and this week, I want to thank you again. I want to imagine that we're, you know, that we're going to put a, uh, we're going to put a sense of self around ourselves, in that this is a, a preserved time where we can have this conversation, uh, and we can start focusing on our needs as carers. Uh, just for, for those that didn't didn't make last week, um, I, my wife, I have permission. She she has a cancer diagnosis. And uh, I have a young family, 12 and 10, and, and we're living with cancer in our house. As I say, we're flying on a wing and a half. That's the way I often uh, describe when people ask. But I'm going to be talking, uh, we're, they're just going to talk a little bit about a very important thing around the whole area of palliative care. And as a psychologist, and um, often we're often challenged around stigma, stigma around mental health, and when people don't talk about certain things. There's stigma too around cancer, we know that as well. And uh, so we're in a stigma busting mode tonight. And to do stigma busting and to have honest conversations and real conversations, it can also raise an anxiety in us because we're sort of going, it's almost like sometimes we talk a little bit about taboo subjects or we get into a, a, a deeper area. But we're doing this in a very safe way, in a very supported way, in a very um, in, in in a space where we we we're. I want you to to express true typing, maybe some fears that you might have. Certainly, opportunity to ask really good questions without being judged, um, and you have the anonymous function there. So, this is a time I often see this in uh, where there's the beauty of the therapy room is you're working with an individual. And quite often they ask you their most deepest fear questions. And in a way, this is a space I'd like to say that you don't, we don't often get this chance to, to try and use it in a way uh, to explore um, our, our feelings, our, our thoughts um, our, around palliative care in one way. And then I'm going to talk about the, the preserving the self, how carers wear different roles and different hats. And sometimes uh, how do we sustain the relationship um, uh, when we move into a caring mode, are we at a point that we can accept the caring mode and some question, questions around that? So I'll be coming back in later on around this. I'm fascinated to hear Deirdre's contribution tonight. Um, but please ask us questions. That's what we're here for. We're here to support you, here to support each other. I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from this as well. Tough, 
but worth it. Yeah, thanks, Eddie. Okay, George, I'm going to bring you back in um, and share your slides there. Um, so here we are. Um, can you let me know. Me. Can you see? Can you see the slides there? I don't think you can actually. Can you? No. No. Okay. Just bear with me another moment. So, um, I'll just try that again. Sure. Okay, we're on now. Brilliant. So, um, okay, there you are, Deirdre. Um, you can just let me know when you need to uh, need to move on. Okay, brilliant. Thanks a million, Helen. And I'd like to really thank the Marie Keating Foundation for the invitation to speak with you all tonight. Yeah. Um, like Helen said, I work with the Irish Hospice Foundation. Um, just to tell you a little bit about who we are, we're a national charity. Our vision is that no one will face death or bereavement without the care and support they need. And our mission, mission is to strive for the best end of life and bereavement care for everyone. On the next slide then, this is just how we organize ourselves. We're in four, um, four, we work in four teams in the organization. We have a bereavement team, education and research, advocacy and public engagement and healthcare. So I work in the healthcare team and a little bit with the advocacy and public engagement team. So that's just a small bit about who we are and where I'm coming from. On the next slide though, I think um, like Eddie said there in, in the introduction, talking about preservation, I'm going to talk about palliative care and what palliative care is um, and hopefully make clear a little bit more about what it's not. Um, a lot of people when they hear the words palliative care or hospice, they automatically think that that means that it's at the end of the road. Um, it must mean that we're dying. Um, it's really bad news when palliative care gets involved. However, that's not always the case. Um, as people are diagnosed um, with cancer and other life limiting illnesses, we know now that people are living longer and they can live really well with, um, with cancer in particular. Um, and palliative care can be accessed really early on in the journey with cancer. And it can be accessed at loads of different points. So you can call on the palliative care team to come in and out if there's problems managing symptoms. And then a lot of the time they become a lot more involved as someone is approaching the end of life. Um, so when we look at what palliative care is, it's holistic care that focuses on relieving pain and other symptoms. So the other symptoms include constipation, breathlessness, and just some symptoms that are, can be a little bit more difficult to manage. Um, it can be accessed regardless of age, what your diagnosis is and what stage of illness is. So like I said, you can access palliative care quite early on in a diagnosis. Um, and then you may not need to hear anything about palliative care for a very long time after that. Um, so you can access it really early on. The idea of palliative care is that it aims to improve the quality of life of people and their families. So it's not just available to the person with cancer, it's available as a support. Um, so it's there to help family carers and those around the person who has cancer as well. Um, like I was saying, palliative care is often offered alongside other treatments. So you could be getting chemo, um, even if you've got infections, you can be getting antibiotics all the way along. And then you might just have some symptoms that are a little bit more difficult to manage, like breathlessness or like constipation or like pain that's just a little bit trickier to manage and the palliative care team can come in and offer support around those things. Deirdre, just, um, I just wanted to add there that during Carol's treatment in the early phases that the, uh, the palliative care team were brought in to around symptom management and uh, again no, because of my own nursing background, I'm aware that the, 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 the palliative care offers so much added value in this quality life piece in terms of uh, symptom management that they were able to support the treating consultants in the treatment and then they were able to exit out of our care, but made a very significant contribution in that early part of the care. Just Brilliant. It's part, yeah. of our, part of our story, you know. It's great, and it's great to hear that because when you're you're hearing these things, it's it's great to put the context on it, um, and and really, I suppose, explain the value of having access to palliative care that early on, and the positive contribution that it can have. Um, the most important thing on this slide really is the very last point that's in bold writing: receiving palliative care doesn't necessarily mean you are dying. 
Um, I said it at the beginning, but a lot of people, when they hear palliative care or they hear hospice, they think, gosh, that must be it. And that's not the case. Um, and I think if you take nothing else away from this evening, it's that. Um, if you hear the words palliative care, don't panic. Um, on the next slide, brand. then. Do you think we should rebrand palliative care? Oh, we, God. <laughs> so really, it's like it's really about the focus on enhancing the, the well, ma maximizing the person's quality of life really yeah. you know? absolutely so, yeah i have a slide later on from dame cicely saunders who's the the founder of the modern hospice movement and she talks about living until the end and it really is about living it's not about dying mm -hmm. so it's actually quite the opposite of what people think it is mm -hmm. um so you're onto something by saying that you know, we should look at calling it something else. But then, then what is that? What what do you what do you call that? And I think it's the deeper understanding, isn't it, of what whatever it's called, what is it? Because another you know another term might might you might start off again with, with a misunderstanding. So exactly. the understanding has to be very very clear. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just on this slide, then I have I've just put up a question about who provides palliative care. So. Within Ireland, palliative care, all healthcare professionals have a basic level of training in terms of palliative care. So all doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals that you come into contact with have a certain amount of palliative care that they're able to um, deliver. Sometimes, like I said, um, if you've got symptoms that are a bit more difficult to control, the specialized teams come in. And so that's where the words palliative care are often introduced when the specialized doctors come in um, and they they can be called in at any time to provide advice um, about treatment options and guidance and care and support with decision making. So one of the important things that they do is um, introduce the concept of advanced care planning um, and getting people to think about things well in advance rather than as people are deteriorating and coming to the end of life and they help prevent that crisis management or crisis Here's, decision you know, making. I'd be, interested, I'd be interested in our participants tonight, maybe, you know, draw what would advanced care planning, what is it? Just maybe helpful. Maybe you're going to do this later on, but I just think some questions like, what is advanced care planning? What does that look like? What does that feel like? Because I think it's critically important in care, you know? Yeah. I haven't got specific slides on it, but I can talk about well, it. Like just conversation, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on the next slides, then, um, the slides really just focus on palliative care, and then we can tease out the advanced care planning bit, because a lot of things around advanced care planning are around having the conversation. Um, mm. and, um, and, and that's what causes the most anxiety for a lot of people. Um, in terms of accessing palliative care, then, and how much it costs, um, anyone can access palliative care in Ireland. Um, I know from my own job that not everybody experiences that ease in accessing palliative care, but it is available to everybody in the country. Sometimes you have to ask for it, unfortunately. Um, but it is available all across the country and it is free in Ireland. Um, sometimes if you've got medical... There is a geographical, like, you know, maybe in the urban centres, the, you know, the specialist palliative care teams, but maybe more in the rural areas, there's not necessarily full, fully um, filled the, teams. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, there's community palliative care teams that operate all across the country. So palliative care teams operate from different places, from either acute hospitals or hospices mm -hmm. across the country. Not mm -hmm. all parts of the country have access to an inpatient hospice unit. Um, most significantly, the biggest gap in the country at the moment is in the Midlands, um, where they don't have access to, to a hospice. You know, just because, yeah. you know, it's important. Um, yeah. So over the last couple of years, um, more inpatient hospice unit, units have opened. So most recently, Kerry Hospice is open, Wicklow Hospice, um, Waterford Hospice is, is available now. Um, but the biggest kind of black spot area in terms of an inpatient hospice is the Midlands. Mm -hmm. But in saying that, there's a really active community palliative care team in, in the Midlands. Um, and, and so... Even if you are in, in any of those counties, you can access palliative care um, wherever you are. So 
um, you can your GP can do it or you, they come out from from the hospice as well. Um, and Deirdre, just out of interest there, um, how, how, what is the waiting list like for, I know there's different levels of access to, to a hospice, but could you explain maybe what, what the levels are and, and what the waiting times might be for somebody, I suppose, needed? So in terms of waiting times, it's really variable. It, it, it really depends. So there's no actual data in terms of waiting times. Okay. Um, in terms I'm sort of, of shocked. Is there a waiting time for palliative care? Like, I mean, it's just... No, for, the, I mean, for a hospice in, bed. Or in for palliative care. Yeah, so, so it, like, like I was saying, everybody, I think there's a, there's, there's a little bit of, of maybe misunderstanding around it. So if you are in an acute hospital, you can be seen by the palliative care team. If you're at home, you can be seen by the palliative care team, but you may not necessarily have access to a hospice bed. And I think that's what you're getting at, Helen, is it? Yeah, well, I'm thinking for um, those who need it, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so like, uh, unfortunately, people would ring me all of the time asking how to access palliative care. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a hospice bed available for everybody, even if people want it. But there is palliative care available. So the, the community teams can go and see somebody at home or the, they, the palliative care teams can see somebody in hospital as well. Yeah. Um, so that's that I suppose in terms of the cost of it then like I said there it's free if you've got health insurance and um, the insurer might be asked to contribute towards the cost of palliative care um, on the next slides then I think this is this kind of answers or draws in a little bit of what what I was saying in terms of do you needing do you need to be in a hospice to access palliative care and the simple answer to that is no um, Palliative care is available in all settings. Um, so like I said, it's available in hospitals, residential centres and nursing homes. And I think it's important to reiterate the fact that all health and social care professionals, so all doctors and nurses you come into contact with have a, a basic level of palliative care that they're able to, to deliver. Um, a lot of the time I take calls from lots of members of the public and a lot of people who are at home always kind of ring and ask how to access palliative care. A lot of people don't know how to get it. They see it as this wonderful thing that's up there in as uh, as something that's on a pedestal and it's not. It's really difficult to get. But if you're at home, the community palliative care teams can see you at home. Um, so it's up to your GP. So if you're if you're at home, the GP is the most senior medical person who's responsible for your care. And he or she can send a referral to the community palliative care team. And the community palliative care team can then come and see you in your home. Um, and okay, I think we've lost Deirdre there for a minute. Um, so, I mean, I probably know what Deirdre is going to say there. Palliative care teams working under the GP practice or in acute hospitals can actually come into your own homes. Um, and do full assessments and do regular visits if needed and required um, to see people in their own homes and manage their symptoms and keep them, keep them well and even offer things like complementary therapies at times too. So you've got the whole well-being and the holistic approach to care, which is absolutely fantastic if anybody I can think, experience that. I think it's important to say there that the, the care, often there's a view that... Uh, care can be better in a hospital environment than in a home environment mm. but actually the individual might want to care in their own home environment rather than yeah. a hospital environment so yeah. you, you can still give high quality care in the home environment but this is necessary but there's often and we I hope we get into our conversations later on about tipping points sometimes I think when it, as a carer I'm going to wear the carers hat on top here yeah. but there's there's often a, a tipping point there's a tipping point where the carer gets overwhelmed in terms of the complexity of the care that's required. And this is where maybe the advanced planning a little bit comes into play yeah. or yeah. the impact on the care is so great. Then it might require like that there's nursing, more nursing uh, type care involved um, yeah. that, that it would tip into uh, needs professional care as opposed to family care type of thing. Yeah. And even like respite care for families too comes into that same equation, doesn't it? Like if, if, if it's becoming really tough to look after someone 
as Deirdre said earlier on, you know, palliative care look after the family as well as the person who is who needs symptom management. Sorry, Deirdre, you're back, are you? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened at all. I was I was thrown out, but I'm but I'm but I'm back. And well, you're and back. I have <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. I've put some light on the subject as well. Okay. <laughs> um, um, Do you want me to move on? Yeah, I think so. I th- I, yeah. I I think so. I I suppose. Um, then I I've just put this in. What happens if you don't get palliative care? Um, and it really results in people dying unprepared. So that touches on the whole concept of advanced care planning. Um, sometimes there's inadequate symptom control. Um. As an organization, we asked people in 2016 about their wishes and preferences for their end of life. And a lot of a lot of people told us that their biggest fear was about was dying in pain. Um, And one of the ways to prevent that really is to access palliative care, because it's one of the things that palliative care teams are specifically um, that that's what they're specialized in. in And they know. Yeah, yeah, they know how to manage pain. pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing as well, if you if you don't get palliative care, there's little opportunity given to you to engage in advanced care planning. Mm-hmm. And I, I suppose just to pick up on that, what advanced care planning is, a lot of the time it's about making plans in advance for something that might or might not happen in the future. Um, and anytime I'm talking about advanced care planning, the most important thing around advanced care planning is having conversations. Um, if you are able to have conversations about some of the really difficult things in life, like, you know, some people, some people really know that they don't want to be resuscitated or they know that they don't want certain treatments um, and they're able to write those things down really early in advance. It makes things an awful lot easier for family members and it prevents that crisis decision making. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just makes things an awful lot smoother. See, um, on that, though, is, you know, the because I sometimes they're they're very challenging conversations for carers to have with their loved ones. Okay, absolutely. And uh, and and we'll say, in a way, you the I would think that it's um, palliative care might come in too downstream for that advanced care plan. Do you know what I'm getting at? Yeah. That, Maybe that convert would it? Do you do you think it would be helpful if there was a a, a a component of that that could be done earlier on? Yeah. Or, so we we have a think ahead program, um, and even though it sits within the Irish Hospice Foundation, it's really a program that encourages everybody, regardless of your age, regardless of you having a diagnosis or having no diagnosis, to to think about what's important to you and write it down. Mm-hmm. Um, we, there's a form that we have it's a green a lot lots of people call it the green book called the think ahead form um, and it's divided into five sections and we tell people that they can fill in as much of it or as little of it as they want but it's a tool and it's a tool for so many things because it's a conversation starter if you access this tool you can bring it to someone I know I, I've brought it to my parents and said you know, this is something that you need to think about. Uh, who are and my parents, thankfully, are young enough, they're fit and they're healthy, but it's still something that's relevant for them to think about. One and of the things it, we talked about last week is um, that some people are information seekers and blockers, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, um, uh, and there's different communication styles. Like I, I couldn't imagine in that because uh, Carol was uh, my wife was a, an information blocker all right so it'd be very it's like it's it, it it would take an extra step to have advanced care planning as it were even with my nursing hat on to uh, to have those conversations yeah in, in a person who doesn't want to have these conversations yeah um yeah. so it, it, it's quite challenging have you how have you managed that in from a hospice hat on well, there's a, there's a few different ways of looking at that. The thing about advanced care planning is some people, like you said, some people want to go there and some people don't want to go there. And it's not compulsory. Mm-hmm. So as a healthcare professional, though, it's up to us to constantly give people opportunities. So a lot of the time, it's about picking up on cues that people will give you. Because some people might come across as being, oh gosh, I don't want to talk about that. But they might say things like, I don't think I'm getting any better or 
I think I'm getting a little bit worse or um, I'm a little bit worried about my money or I'm a little bit worried about, you know, some, somebody else I miss got this kind of treatment. And I know initially for me, when I was a nurse first, it was, it's very easy to knock or to block those conversations and say, oh gosh, no, not at all. Like that's not going to happen to you. But if you actually pause for a second and te- try and tease it out with people. So it's about being brave enough to have conversations that matter. That's it really. In a way, it's a couple of things. The person can be very, uh, what holds them back is fear about having an open conversation. Mm-hmm. But also what holds other people back, whether it's the care or the professional, is that they don't necessarily have the confidence to to get over their own fear. There's fear on both sides working here. Absolutely, yeah. And fear can drive people back into non-communication. And I suppose tonight we're here, and it's again, there's some really fabulous questions have come through. So please get some questions coming through, you know, and and, and use the the great wisdom of, of... uh, dear Janeiro, please. Yeah. Um, dear, I'd like to add something there as well, because having been an oncology nurse most of my life, um, you know, you often, you, there are opportunities, there are so many opportunities to have these conversations. And it's often a, like when maybe, you know, there's a decision to, to add another yeah. treatment or, um, and, you know, the person is already kind of tied to a hospital bed. Um, and the conversation can actually, you can slip in a conversation so much easier when, you know, they're questioning, will this work or not? And you think, well, you know, what, what is it you need and want for your life right now? Um, and how, how can you plan that? Um, so that, that can be a conversation when treatment changes or treatment is not working and there is an opportun- there's a real opportunity there. And the other thing I would like to mention is, you know, these forms, like, again, hospices are terrifying places for some people. They don't want to go there. They don't want to, you know, have that conversation. But these forms can be picked up um, in Citizens Advice, Bureau of Medical Social Workers as well. Um, And that can be the beginning of, you know, a conversation leading into palliative care and hospice care. And I think it's a nice, it's, it's another way of thinking about how this process can happen where there is some uh, a block towards maybe hospice care you know so yeah. it's, it's just another and way having something about. if you're a family yeah. carer and you're afraid to have the conversation having something like the booklet or having mm-hmm. a tool to help you open the conversation is often the hardest part yeah. because a lot of people i've done work with a lot of people around advanced care planning and a lot of people like eddie you said there's this massive fear. I'm afraid of upsetting somebody. Um, I'm afraid of getting upset. I don't want to know those things or that'll never happen. There's a massive amount of denial around this. And a lot of people will, and a lot of people get lots of anxiety around that then. But if they have something physical to say, you know, this is a good idea or I've seen this. Um, and what we say to people about the Think Ahead form is that they can fill in as much of it or as little of it as they want. They don't have to fill in any of us. It's not compulsory at all. Mm. But the most important part is about having those conversations, having really meaningful conversations. In the way and not that, yeah. being afraid. You know, what's interesting is that the denial, the people who deny in, are in denial, that's actually a coping mechanism in, of itself. Um, it might be the word, but may, the, but, well, it's arguable, because I think I remember I talked about people who there's absolute deniers that go through the whole journey in that denial mode and the outcomes are the same for the deniers as it is for those that are the real positive optimists and go-getters it's the people who are anxious that struggle quite often more in terms of their quality of life and uh, outcomes um mm-hmm. that's from sort of psychology bit of it um it, 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 you know so i i think it's challenging having the conversations and uh, uh I'm, I'm not sure I think if it comes from a professional space, mm-hmm. if as well as the care, I think it shouldn't only be from the care space, because I think the care quite often knows the other individual best, and if they don't want to talk about it, yeah. Uh, whereas with the the privacy of maybe a, a, like a, the value of the, doing uh, counselling or healthcare or public health nurse or someone like that, then 
in that space quite often that can be that can be a very powerful place where that that conversation can happen yeah. but i because think people, there's there's they, a bit about breaking down like as a society as a people as irish people we're not yeah. great at having these conversations yeah. No, we're, we're, not. we're yeah. massive deniers of death and dying. We're brilliant at funerals, but yeah. we're not good at the, the bit before that. Um, and, and there's a but bit... But is that about... not the case for our, lots of societies? And is oh, that not, well, so maybe it's a, So maybe that's part of the human condition and uh, I, as opposed to just an Irish piece. And, and, and then if it's part of the human condition, it must have a, a service, a role. It serves, it serves a role. So... Or, or, I suppose, but what we know from our work in healthcare is that having the conversations in advance can be really powerful in mm. uh, in impacting on more better quality life, and that's yeah. the key takeaway. I suppose I'm just saying it might not necessarily be the carer doing it with their loved one. Yeah. It could be that as a healthcare professional might do it with the loved one. And I think, like down down the line, there's there's new legislation that, that's coming about. And I think there's, there's going to naturally be um, a whole load of awareness raising around making decisions for yourself mm. um, and making um, advanced healthcare directives in particular. Um, people know them as living wills. But there's, there's legislation that will support that. And there's a new office that will, over the next couple of years, be engaging in awareness raising campaigns about the importance of planning ahead and if you look at countries where this is much more the norm than it is here the the, the biggest one being america more people are inclined to engage in advanced care planning and not be afraid of it when they know what it is and they know more about it so there's there's a there's nearly like a layered there, there's a whole layer of of things that are, are needed to to help people understand what it is and understand the importance of it mm. and the lots relevance of, of it. Lots of important. And you said there's an office there. Can you tell us a bit about that? So the Decision Support Service is a new office that's been set up under, it's, it, the legislation is called the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. Um, mm. So it's a new, a, new, a new office called the Decision Support Service. Um, Anya Flynn is the director. It's not fully functional. Um, but within the HSE, the, le the legislation needs new um, codes of practice or guidelines, rules and regulations about making decisions and making advanced health care directives. So they're hoping for full commencement of that legislation by the end of next year. So over the next year or two, we should be hearing as a society, we should be hearing a lot more about decision making and about making decisions for yourself in terms of your health care. Um, so hopefully it's a little bit like we'll be hearing more and more about mm -hmm. it and having these conversations is one element of that that's so important um, I just wonder how our, how our participants feel like would they would they have concerns maybe if you could say that you think it's a good idea or like and you could type in good idea or maybe have some concerns and maybe our participants could just pop in a word there and uh, what they feel like concerned or it seems like a good idea, good idea, something like that. It'd be interesting to just get a feel for that. Or maybe that, we could... that could go in the chat button there, actually, couldn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, will we take some questions, do you think, just so that we can actually, um, I suppose, uh, connect with the audience? Would that be okay? Oh, yeah, it'd be great. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, this is an interesting one, actually. Can I, as a carer, access the palliative care team, even if, um my you know the person i'm caring for does not want to so no, no unfortunately so the person has to be under the care of the palliative care team yeah um, that's sort of like in mental health that's like someone saying can i talk about somebody else's care without their permission that yeah. goes back to consent really you know yeah I guess what could happen there is um the care themselves could go to one of their local cancer support centers and, and seek some kind of help and support for themselves as a carer because they do need it, um, but not kind of in, in, this, in this setting, but definitely uh, to recognize. I'd like to reinforce that because again, I told you like Carol was the information blocker and uh, you know, he was the seeker and the, 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 the sort of uh, the, the tension that, or the hardness, I found that very challenging and then I accepted that's 
or, or, or but I used the ca- cancer. Carol wouldn't go to the cancer support center, but I went to the cancer yeah. support center. Yes, so, yeah. 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 so they do look after family members very well, don't oh, they? Very, uh, yeah, yeah, always. Especially yeah. if you're self-seeking, I would imagine it's much, much better. Yeah, well, you know, and uh, it was intermittent. Uh, I, I probably attended my six or eight sessions, and uh, and it, it, I did it. Actually, it was to me it was a massage actually mm-hmm. that they offered a, a therapeutic massage. Yeah. So because uh, I carried the stress in a very physical way in my shoulders and back and stuff like that, so uh, I found that. Then just the whole environment, just knowing. Uh, known, uh, and I'll talk about this later on a bit around that preserving the self, and uh, you know, a little bit more. Okay, yeah, it's, it's some great questions. Then. Um, do the palliative care team offer night nursing services? So, night nursing is available through the Irish Cancer Society and the Irish Hospice Foundation, so it's not um, available through the HSE, yeah. so it's a uh, it's, it's charity. Based, but it is available to everyone with cancer. It's quite a nice service, actually. I we as a family used it when my father was dying, um, and it was really nice to get a little bit of, for for me as as maybe a carer, you know, and a nurse as well, to get a little bit of respite from eleven to six in the morning. Even though you didn't, even though you didn't maybe go to sleep, but you rested a bit, and it was really nice. And the other more really important thing there, I think, is they looked after the whole family because I had brothers who couldn't cope. Um, and weren't coping very well at all. And they would take them aside and, and talk to them about, you know, their fears. And, and that was really nice. It was like a, a huge weight lifted um, from myself and maybe my mum as well at, the, at that time. Incredible. Like they were involved in my brother-in-law when he passed away with a brain tumour. And uh, a number of years ago, they were doing incredible work. I know they come in at that very late stage, but yeah. they're fabulous clinicians, great nurses. So they are... Yeah. Okay, um, you probably, you, you certainly touched on this, Deirdre, and I think Eddie and yourself had a conversation about this. Is there community palliative care all over the country or do you have to be near a centre? So you've certainly touched on that. Yeah, so community palliative care is available all over the country. You don't have to be near a hospice, an inpatient unit. Yeah. Um, so if you're to access this, the best way is to get to your GP and ask yeah. your GP to, to send a referral. Yeah. What's um, the what's the dynamic there? Is there I, I, I just is 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 there more a push for care at home? Are we are we creating centres of excellence again and pushing people back into in, in, institutional care? Where where is that? Well, uh, if you if you're to look at healthcare policy, Sláinte Care would say that the push is is for home care. I think um, any of the I suppose noise or rumblings from the Department of Health at the moment is, is supporting that push towards community care. I think the there's a lot of, the difficulty is that acute services cost so much money and they take up, they take up so much of the budget. So it'll be interesting to see how Slauncha Care is funded you can only imagine and implemented. That, like the ideal care for somebody in end of life is home. Most people in Ireland say that they want to die at home. Yeah, yeah. Um, the only, I suppose, the only thing about that is, it's also important to recognise that that's not always possible. Mm-hmm. So even if people want to die at home, sometimes the best place for them to actually die is in hospital, um, and that's not a bad thing either. I think you know, there's a little bit of, you know, you need to understand the nuances of of somebody dying at home. Uh, again, to go back to the survey we did in 2016, most people said that they wanted to die at home, but they wanted to have an ICU in the kitchen. Um, right. yeah, so yeah. there's a little bit of, you yeah. know, you need to understand what's, you know, what's practical and what's available to you in the community. And sometimes, sometimes the best place to die is actually a hospital. And it's not a failing if somebody yeah. wants to die at home and as a carer, you've done your best to do that and they have to go to hospital because their symptoms just can't be managed. So okay. there's, there's lots of, um, there's, there's lots of different nuances around. I, I think even that is another conversation in itself, dear Janetti, you know, where, where people feel they fail when they, you know, have to bring their loved one to hospital. It, it's a, it's a, I've, I've, I've worked in oncology, you know, very recently. Yeah. And there was, this, there is often a real sense of failure, you know, having to do that, but, it is, you know, and then you have to, you know, really uh, console the family 
and say this is the best place like it's you know often it's so tricky even when you're a nurse sometimes you know nursing at home and if you're not a nurse and you don't have a nurse within the family that's even like hugely difficult yeah. it um, comes up the whole time in in the context of advanced care planning because so many people will often say that they they know where they want to be cared for and how they want to be cared for and lots of family carers I, I think all of us who who've looked after somebody would you want to do the best for the person mm-hmm. um, and to kind of think that you're going against their wishes can can be so heartbreaking for, for yeah. people. And, you see, that's and, what I call a tipping point, right? Um, the tipping point is where, and often I think, uh, where a family member feels guilty uh, for maybe feeling that they left down the wishes of their family member but the tipping point is that their care needs has gone beyond the scope of the home environment. Um, I, uh, uh, it's like frail elderly, like the, you know, it's, it's in loads of different places, like uh, where you're concerned about somebody maybe. And, and it, so it, that tipping point creates a pressure and a stress on the care to the point that it actually could mean that the care could crumble because they uh, they're, uh, have too high an expectation of their ability to care, particularly when there's like technical aspects of care, and they mightn't have that. And certainly they're not going to get the support yeah. through home-based tr- support or I'm talking about home care, home yeah. health. Coming in for an hour a day is not going to wa- wash, really, you know? Yeah. I don't mean it's not going to do the work or the activity. Okay, no, that's so. I just I'm going to put the cares hat on here and say that it's, it's it's not as straightforward, you know. Um, it's definitely not as straightforward. And Deirdre, there's like again following on from from that conversation, and maybe you know the care is family member dying. Um, you know, huge probably. There's a question there around bereavement counselling, which I know you offer in the Irish Hospice Foundation. How do people access that? So we have. They, uh, um, if you if somebody you care for has died under palliative care, you can access bereavement support through the hospice service that or the palliative care service that they were linked in with. Um, we this year during COVID nineteen with the HSE we set up the national bereavement um, support line and that's open every day from ten to one, um, and it's a free phone number. I think it was on the end of one of my slides there. Um, I'll put, it, I'll put your slides up again in a minute. Sorry. Yeah, don't worry. Um, to happen, so, yeah. Um, and then the other way to access bereavement support is through the GP as well. Okay, yeah. So it should be it should be an easy process. It shouldn't be a difficult process for somebody to access bereavement counselling. No. I think, again, it's geographically, isn't it? There's a, like having bereavement counselling is quite... There's, and there's gaps in certain geographic areas for ge- for bereavement counselling. Yeah, definitely. I think now maybe certainly the online, I know that, that, that more and more, particularly with COVID now, and I know with my HSC hat on, that there is bereavement, if a person's bereaved by a, through the COVID period, it doesn't have to be from COVID per se, or they don't have to be in a, in a palliative care model of care. Mm-hmm. Their, their family members can access bereavement support in certain areas. Yeah, so for anybody even outside of cancer, yeah, um, death from COVID, it's so important to seek that kind of support, isn't it? Um, yeah, and I think a lot of people, bereavement is the, if you look at the definition of palliative care, it includes bereavement support, so it includes care of families after death, and yeah. even throughout death, a lot of people don't recognise the the grief that that can happen before somebody dies um so you know bereavement support is is part of is part of palliative care but it's often forgotten because it yeah. kind of falls yeah. off at the end really important part um and I, I suppose i've got a question for you Deirdre around you know thinking ahead and planning um i suppose in my own experience i have felt that people die um a much easier, smoother death than those who have left a lot of unanswered questions. Would that be true to say, or is it is it is it too difficult to even answer that, or is it just it's very individual? I'm sure. I think 
yeah I think it is individual I suppose the only thing around that is any of the research that's been done around advanced care planning and the impact of it on people they will say that it's they feel like a weight has been lifted off their shoulders Um, say the re- stuff that I did around th- with with people with COPD they said that they they're glad that they have it done and they can focus on living Um. The thing with palliative care research is that it's really difficult to 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 do the research in 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 that area but that's that's the bit that we know in terms of advanced care planning if you do it early people and families report just feeling relieved and and feeling like a weight has been lifted off their shoulders and living their lives to the yeah. end the best they can. yeah yeah okay there's um, there's a comment here. Um, community palliative care team were brilliant when my parents were diagnosed with cancer. It was really good after to discuss with someone who had looked after them. So there was a real connection between the palliative care team and the family. And that, that's lovely, isn't it? That happens. That's, that's really nice to hear, actually. Yeah. 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 Um, so we have five minutes left. Eddie, do you want to say a couple of words to, to round off preserving the self in this whole difficult, kind of challenging conversation that we've had? Yeah, um, I want to thank uh, Deirdre, the massive level of expertise there and, and bringing us through the, the services from the Irish Hospice Foundation. And uh, and even though we're, we talked about it in a quite a linear way that, you know, there's this happens and this happens and this happens and this is available. Mm-hmm. Sometimes there's half steps and missteps and human nature comes into play. And part of that uh, role as a carer then is the different roles. Like how do we, do, uh, you know, what I'd like to know is have people accepted the role, the carers that are with us tonight, have you accepted the role of the carer or is it something that you fight with now and again? Um, and maybe if you just could say accept it or not on the chat function, it would be, I'd be sort of interested to know because I know, that when it comes to, uh, you know, when you meet with your family and friends as a carer, uh, people, the first thing is, the, people always ask is, how is the, the individual that has the concern? And uh, they say, oh, well, you know, how are they getting on? And it's almost like they want an update on the diagnosis and update on the prognosis. And um, you, quite often the carers never often ask how they are. And sometimes you might just want to talk about the weather or talk about, uh, something totally different. Like a, it's almost like people frame every conversation through this carer's hat, and sometimes uh, that can be very frustrating. So uh, it's just giving that sense of how do you preserve yourself if you're in that tension mode? If you've accepted it, or you sometimes think, why can't people just? But it's, I know it's part of our life, but it's. it's I often think it's a. Uh, it, it, when you're driving the car and the winds, the rear view mirror is small, we can look in it and then sort of look back at behind. But what it get, if it gets so big, we can't see what's ahead of us. And sometimes when people frame their life through uh, cancer, um, uh, uh, then it's um, a challenging. And I see there one of the contributions is that sometimes they feel that they're forgotten. And it's not that uh, because they're, you know, it's not that, uh, the, it's just the frame of how people frame everything through through this cancer uh, world means that, uh, it, and I think somewhere like along the line, and I'm not talking about a man compartmentalizing it, it's somewhere along the line that uh, how do we get to a point that we can, this is a, a strange bedfellow that travels with us, that how do we either not get into a fight with it, that we that there's a level of some form of uh, uh, coexistence, not living with it. You know, even accepting is quite a challenging word for, for a carer. Um, but I think it's challenging because it changes the nature of the relationship. If you can if you get overwhelmed in that carer's role and you've suddenly become all carer then that relationship dynamic can change because uh, quite often uh, there's a, a period where a person can become more helpless. There's a, a presentation where people can be learned helplessness, to call it, where if you keep doing everything, 
Well, if you keep doing everything, you're going to burn out very fast, I would think. And we'll, that leads us on into our stress and burnout next week. Mm-hmm. So preserving the self is somewhere about traveling with this strange bedfellow. It's sort of a language of just sort of it's come up as, as I'm talking. And how we preserve, how do we do we accept? Why do we need to maybe move towards acceptance in a in a compassionate way? A compassionate way towards ourselves as carers. Because when we're compassionate towards ourselves, we'll be compassionate towards the, the those that we love and care for. And how do we distance ourselves from the negative thoughts about caring? And somewhere get a sense of, you know, that's the, what we can control, what we can can can't control. How do we embed self care into what we do? And uh, we'll be moving towards very practical self care type conversations, and to, knowing that, and calling out that we've asked us uh, like earlier on, we've asked us to talk maybe call out at times the advanced care directive conversation. Mm. But sometimes we might have to call out the, where are we now in the relationship conversation? You know, I'm, uh, can we park this? And if we can, and we just carry on with like being a mom, being a dad uh, for a few hours and have conversations around this, that. And I think they're really helpful as well. So that um, the normal uh, to and fro, the, the conflicts in the relationship, because some people say, they might want to have a conflict, and but you'd normally have it like a, you could have a, a sparky conversation, and that could be part of the relationship. I think that's healthy, and if you start pulling back from that, then you're 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 it's going to eroding the self. So instead of eroding the self, it's about preserving the self, and the preserving the self, I believe, starts about being your true self. You married or you're in a partnership or in a relationship with somebody. And in that relationship, you acted as your true self. And if you start uh, changing that and adapting that, then you're eroding the self. Maintaining that truth between you, the good, the bad, the strain, the fun, the love, the crack, the worry, the share, then you're moving into that space, I think, of um, that honesty. And it's more helpful in terms of preserving the self. Okay, well, that's a very strong message to end on, Eddie. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank you, Deirdre, so much for your expertise as well. And I echo exactly what Eddie said there. I, I, um, Eddie, thank you. We'll see you again next week. I would like to share the last couple of slides you have, Deirdre, because I think they're important as well. So maybe just bear with me a minute and, um, um, and we'll, we'll sign off um, with, um, let's see. Okay, can you see them there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Uh huh. Yeah, there's a question there. I'd like to. Oh yeah. There's questions there before we sign off, Helen. That it's very important questions, but up there uh, around the partner passed away, and I feel like I lost who I was to be, who I used to be now, and I'm not caring for her anymore. How do I get back to my sense of self? So I'd like to maybe I'd like to answer that to the, to the trap. So um, the, obviously that sense of loss after your past, you lost. Um, I think there's maybe a role there for maybe counselling. Um, you know, attending counselling to try and figure that out where you were, what your partner, your relation, your partner has passed away. You know how you're finding that that yourself now in a different phase and age and stage in your life, and we I'm not sure where that that is, and if you have family and uh, you know having a I think a helpful space of the the value of going to a professional space about that. People often say, oh, "I have great friends, and I can talk that about about friends," but the value of going into a professional space about that is you. Friend, uh, they, you could be asked questions that will just give you deeper insight and um, friends that might ask those questions because they might want to hurt you so the friends can be holding and support you but but when it comes to loss and grief and pain and I've done a lot of work on this I've done some very public work on this on Operation Transformation with uh, mums who have had 15 year olds that died with sudden cardiac death and the, with grief and loss like that the, actually the only way is to feel it and go through it, be supported in that going through it, 
and then getting a sense of where am I at now. So that's why I'd encourage you, please come back next week. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, but hopefully that's helpful for you today. And obviously, if you have been now bereaved and your loved one was in palliative care, then there's the bereavement support service from uh, the Irish Hospital Foundation there. Lovely. So uh, do you want to sign off on this slide, Deirdre, yourself? Um, yeah, I can. This is just a quote from Dame Cicely Saunders, who's the founder of the modern hospice movement. Um, and I think it sums up a lot of what we were saying. You matter because you are you and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. Um, so I think that kind of sums it up. If yeah. palliative care is about living yeah. um, and living well until you die. And you don't have to be dying to receive palliative care is a really important no. message, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I'm just going to put this, this slide up because, again, if we're doing a video of, of the, the content, at least this will be shown there. Yeah. Your, your resources, yeah. And the bereavement support line is there on, on that slide as well. And it's open from 10 to 1, Monday to Friday, if anybody wants Pretend to give them a There's not a question that comes through there. Can we... Yeah, sorry, I, did, I didn't see them. They, they hadn't come through on my list. Okay, uh, yeah, no, so I'm, yeah. I'm looking at them here. Yeah. So another one says, any advice and tips after the palliative care nurse has triggered a family division? Being very intimidating towards the patients. No offer of any help or service to the family of what palliative care can offer. That's a very difficult situation. Sorry, so I just think it's important that we, yeah, we, okay. we talk about difficult situations. So we, we, we'll... We'll take all these questions, like because I think they're very valued. Yeah. Valid. So, um, any advice after the palliative care or trigger the family division? So, being very intimidating towards the patients. No, so obviously, if their professional care was um, intimidating, that would be of, of concern. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, a, you know, whoever comes into your home or house, it uh, works within a management structure. And it would be worth uh, feeding that back. Um, uh, I'm sorry that you've had that experience. Um, uh, uh, no offer of any help or services to the family of what pall palliative care. And I think in the bereavement support to that individual, you would be able to maybe explore a little bit around that, what you can do about that situation um, in terms of uh, being assertive to, uh, and writing to the managers or whatever. Uh, or alternatively, you can explore the impact of that family division on you. It sounds quite a painful experience and uh, how that, that has impacted on you. Okay. Is there any other, any other questions there, Eddie, that I, I have missed? Uh, I think that's... Um, Probably the important ones. <clears throat> I think, uh, no, I think to be so, I, I like the fact that I really think that people are putting in really good questions there tonight. And uh, what do you call it? Um, the key, I think, the, the key takeaway there is around the support services offered if you're bereaved. If you're in that bereaved space, I'd like to talk to you and say, you know, come back next week and say you've taken one step around getting some professional support around that to help you in that journey of uh, of uh, healing. It's healing. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Eddie. So I'm just going to move on to a couple of slides. So that's Deirdre's um, email address there. If anybody wants to wants to email into the Hospice Foundation, um, just give you a minute to maybe take that down. Shenanger at hospicefoundation.ie. So thank you, Deirdre, for your huge contribution tonight. Um, we've done our Q&A. Um, and again, I, I put this slide up because like, there's a whole um, array of um, you know, um, sort of issues around quality of life, like the physical health, mental health, social health, satisfaction and beliefs. And then ancillary to that is the environment. So, you know, um, trying to make um, good a good life um, can be difficult, um, and we need to encompass all of these aspects of life in order to to feel the well-being um, 
and that we so wish for, I think, when, when it comes towards that, that end of life, or even at the beginning of a cancer diagnosis, looking at these things and making them better through probably early um, referral to palliation in most of those cases. So it's a very holistic approach to um, a quality of life. And Eddie, you talked about steps there. Um, and, you know, maybe sometimes when we're at the bottom of that step and we're not feeling so good and we're feeling vulnerable, you just can't do it. But it is a step by step approach. You might want to do it. And then you might actually get to a point, well, I do want to do this. How do I do it? And I'll try it. And then you might turn around and say you did it. So it's really important. Steps to success. It's a slow process and it can happen. Um, and we talked about this, Abraham Lincoln, he said, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. And that's all about the quality and how you live your life, isn't it? Um, and we've certainly brought that home tonight. Um, and I think I, I said this last week too, but I think a person caring for another represents life's greatest value. And again, we've had a very difficult conversation tonight. And as carers, you really have the greatest value and you need to take that away with you tonight. Um, there, you know, um, and the other thing I would say, if anybody has any difficulty with anything we've said tonight, we do it, we, we have Eddie on board, we have Deirdre's email, and you can also ring into our office or, or, or email in to our Ask the Nurse service and we will answer your questions or any concerns that you might have over the next couple of days. Um, so, um, and that's where we are. We do have um, lots of resources as well around particular types of cancer. And within those books, there's, there's a huge amount of kind of signposting and direction to like a lot of the service we've talked about tonight and thinking ahead and planning for end of life. So all those conversations happen within those booklets as well. And if you wanted one, you maybe ring into the office on 01628 3726 and we can post one out to you. And, and they're very valuable to have, even as a resource, not necessarily to read from cover to cover. And finally, um, we will welcome uh, Phil, our lovely nurse from the West, Phil Keating, not a, not a relative of the Keating family, as we always say, but Phil has worked with the foundation for many, many years. And Phil is a carer and has lost her mom and her dad through cancer and is now caring for her brother. So Phil has a lot to offer in terms of, you know, recognizing compassion fatigue, building resilience and preventing burnout. Um, and we'll welcome Phil along um, with Eddie next week, um, 7.30 to 8.30 again. So on that note, I think um, COVID is still here. Um, restrictions are increasing again, particularly in the Dublin area. So um, just stay connected. Um, be safe, be well, hold firm, and the rainbow of hope, um, and we hope that this goes away sometime. Um, so thank you so much, Deirdre. Thank you so much, Eddie, um, for, for, for your huge contribution tonight in what was a challenging um, and conversation, but that channel of communication has been opened. Thanks so much and good night. Thank you. Thank you very much.